Well, the interesting thing, as I recall the past, is the way things changed very rapidly. As we moved from the disc into tape, and we went from single-track tape to two-track, and then into multi-track tape, so you could log the information on tape in several different ways, and then you could remix it. You could do all kinds of things with it, which had the effect on the recording engineer of making him more relaxed, and it completely changed his outlook on recording. Um, not to mention the cost of doing these things. I can remember in the studios in those days, um, the cost of renting a studio um, would be uh, a lot higher, relatively speaking, very in mind inflation and so on, than it is today. Um, because of all that was hanging on the importance of getting it absolutely right. A disc recording, apart from anything else, um, the stylus which cut the disc had to be super polished, super sharp and in pristine condition. And you had to be darn sure that you maintained it in that condition for the time that you were using it. Uh, it was very easy for that stylus to hit some little blemish in the vinyl disc that it was cutting and get chipped. You couldn't even see this chip, but you could hear it when you played back. And you could actually see the result of the groove. You'd have a light shining on the groove, and suddenly the groove wouldn't reflect quite as much light as before. Oh dear, I've got a, a chip on the stylus. Well, what do you do? Um, hopefully you've got a second, if it's that important, you've got a second recording machine running in parallel. Now you've got the choice of two of them. But it was a very different situation than we have today, and in fact than we had later, even in the old days. This graduation changed um, the way in which engineers thought about the whole process of recording. And as more engineers came into the picture, so they began to ask for more and more features and facilities, and can we do this, can we do that, can we do the other? And so people like myself had to try and figure out a way of giving the recording engineer what he wanted. And all of these things were moving us bit by bit closer to high quality and reliable recordings. But they're not always better recordings. And that brings us to a different aspect of this subject. Um, the great problem with tape was noise. The, a good signal-to-noise ratio on a good tape recorder was of the order of 55 dB. And uh, then <clears throat> if you had to copy that tape, which inevitably you did, um, as <clears throat> you went from um, a tracking tape where you had uh, recorded your material onto individual tracks, and now you were remixing it and re-recording it onto another tape recorder, you were losing at least 3 dB on your signal-to-noise ratio. Um, during those early days of fighting noise and fighting other technical problems, um, I was introduced to Les Paul, um, who had developed this amazing layering uh, technology of uh, placing one track on top of the other. And today it sounds like a simple thing to do. And, but it was a brilliant concept, but it did introduce more noise. And I can remember a conversation with him where he sounded quite impatient and can't you guys do anything about this? You should be able to go from one piece of tape to another without all that additional noise. Where does the noise come from and so on? So, uh, but he had developed, in effect, 
the, 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 the concept of multi-track, but using only two tracks and two machines as he bounced from one to the other. The technology that went behind it, of course, was always the thing which we engineers were trying to squeeze a little more out of the system. Um, <clears throat> we went on to, from tubes onto um, transistors. Uh, transistors uh, themselves, you had to watch very carefully because of their propensity to introduce noise. So a low noise amplifier was necessary just as it was with the microphone preamplifier. So it, the tape amplifier had to be very low noise as well. And <clears throat> the whole of the recording chain was enhancing or trying to enhance um, the signal to noise ratio. More signal and less noise. Well, tapes were developed which would take a little bit more signal, so that would give you a little bit of advantage. Tapes in parallel would, were also developed which would produce less noise. And bit by bit, um, they improved. And then we got to Ray Dolby um, and his uh, reduction of noise technology. Now, that was a brilliant concept. And uh, he was able to gain some 10 or 12 dB in signal to noise ratio by um, um, enhancing the low levels of signal when it was recording and reducing those signals again when it was replaying so that when you reduced it you were reducing the noise as well and uh, it, it was simple but it was brilliant as the requirement for better quality of um, signal that is less distortion and greater frequency response grew um, so the speed, the tape speed, was increased. We went from 7.5 inches per second, which a lot of the commercial recordings of those days were running at 7.5. We went to 15. Now, that did not necessarily make much improvement to the noise, but it made a lot of improvement to the general um, frequency response and the editing, strangely enough. Um, editing of tapes in those days was done with a razor blade. And um, you, if you had a, a word um, on the tape, which would occupy uh, maybe an inch of tape at seven and a half inches per second, you wanted to cut that word out, you had a job to do. If you were running at 15 inches per second, you had twice the amount of space to use your razor blade on, and that made editing easier to deal with. So, bit by bit, these various enhancements um, in quality came about, and studios, uh, certainly in the London area, huge numbers of studios grew up in the late 60s, and early 70s, competing with each other for quality and for uh, studio uh, usefulness is, I suppose, the best way of describing it. We went to uh, many different studios to check out what they were doing studio owner would approach us and ask us to build him a console. And I think one of the reasons we succeeded where many others didn't succeed is that we didn't just say yes, yes, yes to everything they asked for, but we discussed at considerable depth what it is they were trying to do. And it actually made them focus on aspects of recording which they had taken very much for granted. 
I mean, recording, is it more than just placing a microphone in front of a, a, a music maker, parking it on tape and cutting it to a disc and selling it? There's a lot more to it than that. And many of the studio owners had to be asked to think carefully about what they were doing, why they were doing it, and the effect that they wanted to make on their, uh, on their market. Um, <clears throat> we had, um, we went to the studios, we made recommendations as to the acoustics of these studios, the kind of microphones that they should be using, and the way in which these microphones, the signal from these microphones should be mixed. Um, during that time, we transited from um, a group making music as a group and setting up maybe one or two microphones at a distance from the group and just taking the natural balance that resulted. So bit by bit, the transit was made to multi-microphone techniques. It was good for us because it meant more input channels, bigger mixers, and more um, uh, uh, more elaborate pieces of equipment. And it led also to the um, uh, processing of sound differently from each microphone. Um, so from a simple recording amplifier, which uh, would have a flat response and would be dedicated to one musician or part of the, of the group, you now wanted to treat that one musician um, in a different way, give him a different frequency response. Um, so there are all kinds of, you might say, tricks that were played in the recording studio, which were quite impossible if you didn't have multi-track recording, multi-track mixers, and many microphones. The acoustics of the studio were less important because now you had microphones which were very close to the artist, and so there was less influence from the studio, it's studio acoustics. Um, it, in the long run, of course, it meant you didn't need a studio at all. You had um, um, recording people recording in their bedrooms because you didn't need a studio. Um, and um, I think the way in which it changed music is that it opened up the field uh, for a lot of people who had musical talent uh, to be able to uh, display and exercise and record that uh, result of that, of that tunnel, talent. Um, and it meant that you didn't have to be a very good singer or player of any instrument. A lot of those things could be dealt with. The expression, fix it in the mix, became popular. Uh, as long as you've got a signal there, you could do things with it. You could pass it through a different equalizer. You could change its perspective with regard to the other instruments in the band, and so on. So I suppose it opened up the whole field of uh, popular music to those with good ideas but without a lot of musical talent.